love that phrase, I will be with you in the sunrise of your soul. Mm. So our scripture reading for today, I gotta tell you, to me is one of the wackiest pieces of scripture you're gonna find. So Jesus is talking to some folk, disciples, others, and he says, we find in, in Luke 16, beginning at verse 1, Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager. And charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What will I do? Now that my master is taking this position away from me, I am not strong enough to, to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? And he answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. And he said, here, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, how much do you owe? And he replied, a hundred containers of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and make it 80. This is where it gets a little crazy for me. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light and I can just imagine at that point the disciples going, ah, see, see. And then Jesus hits him with the singer. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. And may God bless our hearing and our understanding these words from our scripture for today. And would you pray with me? Most loving and most gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Hypocrisy. It's perhaps the single biggest reason people say they don't go to church. In fact, according to UnChristian, a book based on surveys done by the Barn Research Group, among people with no religious affiliation in the 16 to 29 year old bracket, 85% say one reason they don't go to church is because Christians are hypocritical. You know, it's such an easy dodge. One word. Why don't you go to church? Uh, hypocrisy. Now, someone has suggested the best response might be, well, there's always room for one more. <laughs> now, that, that, that probably won't change anyone's mind. But, of course, there's a, a kind of truth to what they're claiming. If you're looking for a group of people who always live up to their highest values, and who never say one thing and do another, then you're probably going to need to look elsewhere. So I doubt you'll find a group of any sort totally free of inconsistency anywhere on this planet. But although it can be a, a healthy thing to, to acknowledge the, the contradictions between our professed faith and, and our daily actions, I think it's also useful to qualify our confession a bit. In the New Testament, the only time Jesus hurled the charge of hypocrisy was when people were doing something deliberately to appear outwardly different from what they were inwardly. For example, he spoke about people who gave to charity quote-unquote, so that they might be praised by others. 
Likewise, he spoke against those who love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they might be seen by others. And he also chided the, the scribes and Pharisees for putting on appearances, saying, For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but inside they are full of bones of the dead and of all kinds of filth. Jesus called all of those people hypocrites. And interestingly enough for me, a person coming out of a theater background, I found out that the word that's translated hypocrite actually means actor or stage player, which I've decided not to take personally. How many church attendees do you suppose get up on Sunday morning and think, I'm going to church today so I can pretend to be righteous and appear to be holy? No. In my experience, when church people admit to being hypocrites, we aren't usually confessing to, to play acting, professing to be one thing and actually being another. More often, I think we mean that we feel as if we have failed to follow through on our good intentions. Or that we can still see the gap between the people we feel called to be and the people we feel we actually are. But we aren't trying to deceive anybody. We're seeing where we still need to, to work to bring our behavior up to the level of what we believe it can and should be. To get some perspective on this, the writing team of, of one theological and sermon illustration journal, all of whom are involved in ministry in one way or another, were asked what they thought when they heard the complaint that Christians are hypocritical. And I thought the results were very revealing. While they all heard the hypocrisy charge from people outside the church, they had almost never heard anybody who was leaving a congregation saying that they were doing so because of hypocrites. More often, those folks explained their decision to depart in terms of what they perceived as somebody's failing. The congregation was too insensitive, or didn't have enough activities for kids, or the theology was, was different from what they believed. Uh, the sermons were boring. Uh, they didn't like the new pastor or his or her sexual orientation, or they had a small issue that was never addressed, which after a lengthy period of festering had become an irreparable rift. One person told of losing a member because he was disappointed the pastor hadn't attended a family member's wake. The pastor also had someone leave because of not feeling fed by the sermons, but hadn't had even one person say he or she was leaving because of hypocrisy in the church. It seems like to that list you could also say, we didn't like the color of the carpet that was chosen. I've had that in three different churches I serve. It appears to me then that when someone is outside the church, and quite frankly probably doesn't have much intention of coming in, it's easy for him or her to say it's because of hypocrisy in the church. And because there are some gaps between our best intentions and our follow-through, uh, the person can no doubt find an example of hypocrisy and inconsistency in the behavior of Christians. But church insiders are more likely to see those gaps differently. In other words, if you really get involved with members of a congregation, you are less likely to see problems in the church in terms of hypocrisy and more in terms of human failure. 
And when you're talking about human failure, it's easier to include yourself in that category. In fact, many people stay in the church because, though they recognize imperfections among both fellow attendees and themselves, they also see the church is a place where we're called to a higher calling. And if you pay attention in church, you'll often see people who are working very hard to better and strengthen their faith in their spiritual lives. So, for me, one good reason to come to church is because it puts us in company with other people who also see that gap between their profession and practice and care enough to want to narrow that gap. In church, we find people who aren't that different from ourselves and who are on faith journeys similar to ours. Now, we have to admit, I think, the church has its share of wing nuts and dis disordered personalities here and there. That's church capacity, wider church. And I suppose even some real hypocrites. But, but those terms don't decide the gen to describe the general population of the church. However, for some of the people in the church, a description Jesus gave in our reading for today might be true. The parable of the dishonest manager, a guy who's such an outright rascal that we would never point to him as a model church member. But you know, we can't call him a hypocrite because he, he isn't play-acting at anything and he doesn't appear worried about the fact that he isn't living up to a call from God. He, he's simply looking out for his own hide and he's quite straightforward about it. Even his employer, whom the manager is cheating out of expected income, can't help but evidently be impressed by the manager's resourcefulness. He may, we may well imagine the employer speaking to a, a friend about the incident saying, you know, that guy cost me a bundle. Uh, but you've got to hand it to him for his shrewdness. If only he put that kind of effort into the work I hired him for. Yes, we, we may at times uh, admire his cleverness. Well, we don't go to church hoping to find people like him as Christian models, I suspect. And as Jesus dr draws out the implications of that parable, he says, whoever is dishonest in the very little is dishonest also in much. Clear enough. That fits the manager in the parable. So part of this, part of the point is, don't be like him. But Jesus also states the application positively. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful in much. And it seems to me that those words provide a description of most of the people we actually meet in church. People who are working at being consistent in their approach to both minor and major matters. And sure, even the most sincere Christians don't always hit the mark. Nonetheless, it is good for our souls to be among people who keep striving to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. It is good for our souls to be among people who accept responsibilities in the church, sometimes thankless and even difficult ones, and show up week after week to fulfill them. It is good for our souls to be among people who quietly go about their, their business on the days between church services and do their best to be faithful, honest, and caring wherever their duties are. It is good for our souls to be among people who respond with unwarranted kindness 
to someone in need who unexpectedly happens across their path. Here's an example. I, I understand this is a true story, but the pastor who tells it is left anonymous. I stopped at the local library one day to pick up a book I wanted. And afterward, I was driving out of the parking lot. A filthy, scraggly man in ragged clothes pushing a shopping cart, filled with what looked like to be nothing but junk, shambled across the lot exit. And as I waited for him to complete his passage, the front wheels of his cart caught on a crack in the pavement, and the cart tipped over. I heard some glass shatter as the contents spilled out. And, and, and the mishap occurred right in the middle of the exit. So, so there was no way I could get out until the man picked up his stuff and moved on. But clearly that wasn't going to happen quickly because he, he seemed to be in kind of a, of a daze and was moving as if he didn't, didn't quite know what to do. So I sat there in my car drumming my fingers impatiently on the steering wheel, getting more and more annoyed by the second. Just then, a young woman who was in a car behind me got out and walked past my car to where the man was. In sharp contrast to him, she was nicely dressed, well-groomed, and appeared to be in full command of her faculties. I wasn't close enough to to tell, but I was pretty certain she smelled a whole lot better than he did. And as I watched, she bent down and began helping the poor man put his items back into his cart. And she continued until everything was loaded. She then helped him get his cart past the cracks of the pavement, and he resumed his shuffle on down the street. I have to tell you, never in my life have I felt more like the Levite and the priest who passed by the one on the other side while the good Samaritan in the form of this young woman helped this downtrodden guy at the roadside. And here's the irony. The book I'd come to the library to get was one I wanted to consult for a sermon I was working on on the passage of the Good Samaritan. But in the parking lot, I saw a much better sermon played out in front of me. Now, we, we don't know if it, that young woman was a church person, but anyone seeing her being faithful in a very little could reasonably conclude she was someone who could be trusted to be faithful also in much. This example is more dramatic than most. But coming to church puts us in the company of people who are working at being as faithful in little things as they are at being faithful in big ones. And in my experience, that can inspire us to continue working at this as well. And so, on this first Sunday of fall, can you believe it? May we continue to support and encourage and love one another, even in the midst of our human foibles and shortcomings, as we work together to become all that God calls us to be, all the time. And let us pray. God, I think it's no accident that when the church was established, it was established as a community of believers that we might support one another, encourage one another, hold one another accountable, and rejoice with one another. 
And so, thank you for bringing us together here this morning. And thank you for our home away from home, this community of faith that we call the Golden Congregation of the United Church of Christ, made up of real people. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.